this motion, this House prefers a world with the BCS would now invite the Prime Minister to make their case here, here. So just one minute. starting three two one panel the current world in which we live in is a world where injustices go unpunished because they are not recognized by the law or because the law does not recognize for the effect of behavior on people's social ills and how those social ills go to fundamentally contribute towards the crimes that people go on to contribute in society and the harms that those crimes perpetrate towards human beings and people who live in society, particularly minorities and other groups of interest. We don't think the current systems of justice in the world necessarily cater for that effect of behavior of behavior towards societal ills that lead to crime in society. We're going to address a number of things in this speech, but before I get into that, let's just address the nature and the worldwide nature of this um, behavioral credit system and why we prefer this world opposed to the world in which we have right now. We think this worldwide nature of it addresses many of the inequalities that occur among states with regards to you know, happy, uh, confronting crime or crime that states perpetrate against each other. So we think this system would perhaps be used against a, a state like Palestine or rather the leaders of those states against Palestine because or, or, or those leaders are the leaders of Israel who are perpetrating the harms against people of Israel because that affects people on a global nature. We think this is fundamentally important to this debate. Secondly, we think the global nature will also affect the negligence of the people who are in charge of structures in the world that are meant to enforce accountability, structures such as the International Criminal Court or the United Nations, we think this will help in uh, attempting, to, uh, attempting to fix the power imbalance and the asymmetry that exists with regards to people committing crimes on a state level and their leaders legitimizing those crimes and the ability to be able to gain justice for these crimes in a world like ours. Why are businesses unlikely to abuse this system? We think there exists a great incentive to adapt within societal norms. People, these businesses will want to be seen as people who are enforcing societal norms, and these norms are good things in the society, things that people value. Things like, you know, giving back your change when you, when you go to the shop, or further harm, harmful things like not going to a rob and terrorize, or not going to a shop and terrorizing people and not robbing them at gunpoint. We also think this incentive will be seen by most businesses as a wide array to be able to, to accommodate a vast amount of society. So we don't think that you know the existence of minimum and maximum amounts will necessarily shut down people who commit co petty crimes and will not uh, sh and, and will not shut Wait, wait, wait. I asked if I was audible. Okay. Am I audible now? That's very unfair. Please don't No, no, it's okay. Am I audible now? What? Yeah, I'll just start. Okay. Okay. 
I'll start in three, two, one. Panel, the world in which we live in today is a world where the justice system does not cater for the societal ills that occur in society and the effect of the people's behaviors on those ills on the society and the effect of those ills on crime in society and the effect of those crimes on people's lives, on people's freedoms, on people's ability to be able to exist within a just system that rewards them for their good work but punishes them for their harsh effects of, for the harsh effects of crime in society. Let's address the worldwide nature of it. Why do we pre prefer this as as, as opposed to you know the current justice system when considering the worldwide af aspect of it being you know it can be applied to any a country in the world and that sort of thing we think this will address many of the inequalities that arise with regards to states being able to perpetrate some form of crimes so for example the leaders of israel were able to perpetrate some form of war crimes in in, in palestine and they've not been you know uh gotten some form of correction in society because of the massive power they have in society. We think this will necessarily increase the amount of justice that these people will get because these people and their leaders will not have some form of legitimacy to be able to go out there and buy guns in the open marketplaces. We think businesses will be less likely to trade with these people. But secondly, we think it affects the organizational structures in the world that are negligent to the harmful effects in society. Organizations such as the International Criminal Court and the United Nations that are negligent towards the harm in society because they're controlled by uh, powerful actors such as the United States and these massive G7 countries in the world. Why are businesses unlikely to abuse the system? We think there exists a certain incentive for businesses to be able to be seen as being accommodating towards the society. So a business is, not li is unlikely to, you know, to deny a customer for petty crime, but they're more likely to deny customers who are known to be sexual offenders or who the society has voted them as highly likely to be sexual offenders or people who perpetrate terrorism and therefore these businesses will not want to sell these people guns or sell them some form of propaganda issue that may accentuate their likelihood of being able to commit these societal ills that will lead to crimes. Secondly, we think the services likely to, deny, to be denied to these people are the worst of the services. So as I've discussed, the issues of sexual assault, the issues of terrorism, and those sorts of things that will be happening. What will this do towards preventing crime that this current justice system does not accommodate for? One, we think it will prevent your offending because the likelihood of people being not able to be able to buy things that they need in society will incentivize them not to be able to commit those crimes. But we also think it allows for a critical aspect of correction of behavior. We think these people are more likely to correct their behavior in a world where this behavioral credit system exists. The impact of this on someone's life means that those discretionary feelings are unlikely to be based on factors such as your color, your gender, but how you interact with the world. We don't think people will vote for you based on how attractive you are, but rather how you, how you interact with these people. So for example, you're out there on the street or you just randomly cut cold person. We think, we think this person will rate you lowly because of that and therefore this should affect how much business you get or that sort of thing. We think someone who is protecting you in the society or helping you in the society or donating something in the society is much likely to get a higher score in this key things here before I move on to, uh, to my substantive element. One, why we think people are unlikely to abuse this system. We think there's a generally accepted form of societal ills and behaviors that people see as these are the, are the good things in society and these are the bad things in the society. Yes, there exists extremes and it may be used for those extremes, but we don't think the extremes will be massively outweigh the benefits that we'll get from the massive majority of people who will be using this for the generally accepted societal ills or for the generally accepted societal goods and the virtues in the society. We think this is unlikely to be controlled by the few who can, who can coerce public opinion or who can say, you know, let's bribe this person to vote for me and give me a higher score. We think that in, its, in and of itself is a societal ill that we will want to eradicate. We think the person who will vote uh, who will not vote for the person who bribes them is more likely to, you know, uh, vote is more like, we think people are unlikely to vote for someone who is bribing for them because that in and of itself is a form of societal ill and it has, it's an inherent harm to that. Our point, of, our point of substantive on why we democratize justice and why that is a form, better form of justice why democratization of justice is a better form of justice than what we have in the status quo and why we prefer that world. 
one we think the justice system in our currently in our currently world doesn't deliver redress to these people so you don't consider the victims of those crimes that have been committed but you also don't consider the societal effects of those crimes that have been committed on the people in the society what this then does is that it places an unproportionate burden on the justice system whereby they are restricted by the minimums or set in the law and that minimum that restricts them in this that minimum restricts the justice system towards giving these people you know sentences that are shorter or sentences that are longer than they actually deserve. We think in our world we, con we, con we, we deliver some form of proportionality and we get redress not just for the victims of the crime, but for the society as a whole that is affected by the crimes that these people have. And we think that there's a certain necessity and urgency in this debate, because as we've clearly shown you, there, there doesn't exist a, a justice system that caters to the effects of crime on the entire society. Rather, that justice system focuses on the abstract nature or the abstract effects of those crimes on individuals and the, particularly the victims of those crimes. But secondly, we think there's that failure of those alternatives that is fundamentally important in this debate, and that is why we prefer this world as opposed to those alternatives which do not defer that all encompassing holistic effect of justice on the society. Secondly, we think this is a self-defense mechanism against that failing system that I've described to you. We think it is necessary for the society to have some form of self-defense in in, against a, system, a justice system that does not deliver to them redress, um, that does not deliver to them redress in the way that is proportionate and delivers some form of uh, urgency in the world. The impact of this is that people like Edward Snowden and Julian Assange, who have been unnecessarily kept in cages and in embassies where they don't deserve to be there because of those crimes, and we think these crimes that they committed are not necessarily societal ills, these people won't necessarily have to suffer those you know, lengthy sentences that they deserve or the stripping of the citizenship that they go through. We think this is inherently important in this debate. But in the worst possible case in our world, we think the worst possible crimes get to get some form of proportionate response. So when a war criminal goes to the DRC and people don't know he committed that crime, we think this person will get some form of justice in the form of the businesses being able to deny him their rights, but also the law being able to consider the behavioral aspects of what this person's crimes were in sentencing him and in giving him the appropriate punishment. We think there is also an impact towards social justice movements. Black people will, able, will be able to, you know, rate these people who are racist to them and tell them, you know, you can't just be racist and get away with it, which is what, what most likely happens in the world we exist in today. We think the feminist movement is most likely to benefit from this sort of thing. People in the climate change movement who don't like people who use oil or don't like people who abuse the resource, natural resources in the world, they are more likely to vote negatively for these people and these people are more likely to see the harms that are most proximate to, to them in the form of the capital structures of businesses in the society. We think that is very important in this debate. Thank you, Prime Minister. We thank the Prime Minister for the fine speech. We now welcome the Leader of Opposition to make their case. Hear, hear. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yeah. Shit, I forgot my time. Okay, since everyone can hear me, I hope starting three, two, one. So the problem with side o -O OG thus far is they are ridiculously idealistic because they need to explain why in a world where people get cancelled for not liking Taylor Swift, people get stalked to their homes and attacked for speaking out against musicians, speaking out on political ideas, and simply calling out things against trans culture or like supporting trans culture, right? People will not just simply press a button to put a tag on you as a bad person. They need to explain why that incentive exists, why it's going to work in a way that doesn't happen already in the status quo, and how years, decades of evidence that shows that human beings move as a hive, human beings carry out actions without particularly thinking these things through, and execute these actions in a way that harms a lot of people doesn't function. We think at the point in time where that mechanism doesn't exist, we think it's problematic, right? But responses, like contextually, one, is that we need to realize that the BCS system is not going to float in the air. Somebody is going to manage it, and somebody is probably going to be in control, and is probably going to run this system. 
Understand that the simplest version of the BCS system or the closest approximate to the BCS system now is the social credit system that exists in China. So I think that's like the clearest definition of what that would look like. Something run by the government where people with like multiple citizens can access and control. The problem is that that means that places like Israel or really strong countries that supposedly deserve to get counseled in their world don't get counseled. But most importantly, this debate has never been about countries or them getting credit systems in the first place. So there's no likelihood that they're going to get counseled because all the mechanisms that makes Israel uncounselable, wealth, like tons of nuclear weapons, having a lot of influence, and wealthy Jewish guys, don't go away. At the point where they have all this influence, just giving them a few minus marks is not going to make them stop bombing Palestine. Let's be realistic in today's debate. So, at the end of the day, they now try to be smart and say that businesses are unlikely to use this. The reason why this is also not very bright is simple. Is that the point in which businesses don't use this? This is just another low quality Twitter, like realistically. So that just becomes very problematic. They now talk about businesses counseling people only when they commit crimes. That is status quo. Businesses already deny access to known felons, they deny jobs to known felons in the status quo. And a lot of businesses already get alerts when like sex offenders get to, towards their areas in known countries or in very systematically structured countries. The outcome is that you have no delta in this debate, no relevance. TPM kindly do better. Now to my case. Simple. We think that we have a problem in status quo. That first off, there is already sufficient incentive to be a good person. One, the first version of this incentive is that you are raised to be a good person. Most people come from like significantly decent families or at least years or like decades of indoctrination to, to know what good and evil is. But second of all, there's already societal pressure to make people like conform, either through the forms of council culture, like you want to get more retweets, more likes. Human beings are social animals that are uniquely designed to get all these things or want to get all these things, right? So because of these factors already existing, there is a unique incentive for people to just be good because people want people to like them. So that incentive already exists, right? But the problem is this, right, is that the definition of good varies between societies. And that then creates a pressure for people to be conformist. So if I'm a white man in Texas, then a version of being good might involve me being racist or at least slightly discriminatory towards black people. And that in itself is very problematic. Because when you implement a social credit system that involves or determines that as being good, you drive a world where those particular things get rewarded and we think that is bad. So one. We need to realize why this is problematic. One, as I pointed out before, people are intuitively arbitrary. People will make decisions for the weirdest of reasons. So, because, for example, like Messi doesn't like CR7 and I'm a Messi son, or like I don't like the like referee that the Argentinian referees that ref this Portuguese game for not giving Portugal a penalty, I can go and give them like negative marks, right? Because people attach a ridiculous amount of feeling to somewhat trivial things like musicians, soccer, and their clubs. So realistically, when people then begin to take actions of these basic things, then you can create a very chaotic system where people get pushed back, not necessarily because they've done something wrong, but because society gives you pushback because they just simply don't like you or elements of society don't like you. We think that itself is very problematic and very broken in itself. We think that defeats the entire point of justice. Second of all, there's no limitation on use, so that means that people can use this as creative, as like really fucked up ways, as I pointed out before. Your PR. So in, your, in our world, at least people are able to realize that they need to change the way they engage society. In your world, how do people recognize that? Okay, it's very simple. When you tweet something stupid on Twitter, people tweet back at you and tell you that it's stupid. When you put something stupid on Facebook, people tweet back at you and tell you that it's bad. When you do something fucked up to someone, someone can walk up to you and say, I don't like the fact that you're being racist to me. I don't have to deduct points or send you through a notification system for you to know that you've done something bad. I can confront you and have that discussion. I don't understand why that doesn't work in your world. So we move. But the next thing that needs to be understood is this, right? Is that it kills the driving mechanisms for change. Because the underlying drive for change, especially social change, is discourse. Before people went to protest against slavery, protest against human for human rights or fight, people sat down and discussed and they came to the conclusion, yeah, human rights is probably something that matters. Slavery is probably something that is bad. The problem with whites had to have that discourse is simple. Is that in a conformist world, when you know that when you don't conform to general people's thoughts and ideas and principles, you can get negative voted or you can lose your positive points and by virtue of that be kicked out of systems and society, right? Because you realize that at that point you lose access to a lot of things you normally should have, like food, schooling, businesses don't want to work with you, and this could ruin your career, ruin you as a person, and by extension condemn you to poverty. It becomes really hard for you to even talk about these things for fear of the possible back 
backlash that you can get because you know that these ideas are not normative. So imagine you are a queer boy in a very Christian society. Are you going to ask about queerness knowing fully all the pushback that you could get? So those are things that happen when you don't engage discourse and that means that change cannot happen within those spaces because at the point where you can't even speak about the idea, you probably can't even protest to make that change. So that means that you inevitably kill the likelihood of positive change happening in that world, right? But the most worst of option is this, right? Is that even if someone says, fuck it, I'm going to revolt and protest, and they get a large number, understand how wealthy people and people in places of power are insulated from this influence. One, they have money. What that means is this, because capitalist incentives still exist. Even if they have bad credit scores or shitty scores, they have millions of naira, and they have access to multiple opportunities and multiple alternatives, which means that they don't get the backlash or feel the backlash of these things as worse. But because of how divisive this discourse happens, a lot of feedback, a lot of protesters, a lot of like, activists will feel this feedback. The problem with them feeling this feedback at the point where this discourse then happens is that they actually suffer for it and they actually get kicked out of society and they lose these opportunities. What that means is that there becomes an, a very clear imbalance of power that exists when people are fighting protest or protesting injustice. We think this becomes a lot worse for one simple reason. Because in a comparative now world, the imbalance already exists. But when you make it systemic, when you implement it into society, and you make a system that makes it exist for a very long time, it becomes a lot worse. We do not want to empower injustice in our world. We are very proud to stand against it. Thank you. We thank the leader of opposition for that fine speech. We now welcome the Deputy Prime Minister to round up the debates for their side. Here, here. Um, am, I, am I audible? Am I, I have to hold it okay. I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Panel, we think there is an intrinsic and important thing to note about how people behave in their everyday life. That is what this debate is largely about. To the extent that we are able to evaluate people on how they relate with society on their day to day, on, on their daily basis, we think this is very important for, their, for this um, motion, right? But first of all, let's, let's, um, let's analyze habit and how that impacts behavior. We tell you that to the extent that people do, people does, uh, people do something once, it only makes it that once. But what makes people's behaviors is, some, is the things that they do on a constant basis, on a day-to-day -day basis. To the extent that we have a system that can evaluate people on that metric, as opposed to evaluating people on a single... Um, Basically, seeing one side of the story, it becomes very harmful. They talk about cancel culture and how... Um, it is a means of checking people. First of all, we tell you that to the extent that a, a, a person does something that is not is considered societally wrong, we tell you that we will not. People's emotions will more likely be um, be more rampant when that scandal goes up. If we are able to judge people by their day-to-day -day activities, then we are reducing um, the amount of people who are being cancelled well, without any justified reason. Because we are able to analyze these pe people at a personal level, and we believe that is important. They tell us that they already sufficient incentive to be a good person in status quo. We tell you that the incentives and the discourse that exists in status quo are not enough because to the extent that a, a chief justice can walk into an establishment and pinch a watchman's nose because they, they don't think they are on the same level, that is harmful and that is what determine, that is what specifically establishes the behavior of this person and what this person is um, truly is. We think it is, it is better to judge people on that metric than judge them on a metrics of social media of where people's emotions are more likely to be impacted by um, the, the things that don't matter. We think the people that, uh, that deal with people daily are the right people to pass judgment on these people. 
My partner talks to you about how the businesses are, are the most legitimate actors to enact this kind of system. First of all, we tell you that service pro providers are the people that face the, the, rap, the wrath of people the most because they're the ones who are looked down upon on society. So to the extent that we can judge someone's character at that level on how they interact with society, we tell you it is very important for us. Um, the second point I want to get to, the use of um, character evidence in courts of law and why that is important. We tell you that it is important to make, to legitimize character evidence in, in courts of law to allow courts assess the nature of crimes and the causes of crimes and better address the ends of the justice system. So I'm going to address this in twofold. First of all, character evidence is currently not admissible in courts of law. If it is admissible, it is considered hearsay which is still not admissible because it is, cons uh, because it is just what it is from hand it is from a from one person who is speaking on the character of this person to the extent that when someone is charged in a court of law for a crime that they are probably innocent it is important that we analyze the person's character um outside of this crime to better um to better basically establish their innocence or guilt on top of the evidence that is provided. Because sometimes the crimes that are committed are, um, character can be very important in establishing the cause of the crime and basically the innocence of the person. Secondly, in addressing the aims of the justice system, we tell you that currently the correctional facilities are not achieving the aims of the justice system because if anything, we are creating more brutal, um, more brutal, um, criminals, and basically we are not we are not achieving redress. We are not achieving rehabilitation, which is the most important aim of the justice system. Yeah. To the extent that we are able to analyze people's characters and basically um, um, uh, analyze the causes of why they committed the specific crimes that they committed, we are better able to rehabilitate them in these facilities. And even outside that, we are better able to solve the cause because if we find out that um, the cause of um, the, 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 the cause of the robbery was because this person was born in a poor background and was unemployed. The government is better able to do something about it and address the aims of the justice system and protect the citizens. Secondly, it also helps in an era where mental health issues are the biggest problem in society today, analyzing people's character and how they relate with society and how they relate daily with individuals becomes very important in addressing key psychological issues that that um, that are important that that um, add to the behaviors of people, and we value that in our in, in our side of the world, right? Um, we tell you that the notion of equality doesn't still exist. There are still celebrities and politicians who are already being treated differently in society. To the extent that celebrities and politicians will not be treated the same when they walk into these businesses, we tell you that it is, it is very harmful. It is better that the merit, the metric by which we use to discriminate people, it becomes their behaviors and their characters, that we treat you better because you are a good person and we interact with people better, as opposed to just having a large number of followers on the internet or a large support by, um, from, from politicians, right? Even if they tell you that the scale is um, the emotions of people and we only interact with, that you only get, vo get votes um, according to how much people like you, we tell you that the likelihood, the, the likelihood that the ratio of people who will not like you for no reason, like, like that people don't just like you for no reason, and the ratio of people who will not like you for no reason is minimal compared to those that will, like, will not like you for a substantial reason. And I'm not talking about strangers on the internet or whatnot, because this is a system that, may, that deals with people one-on-one. -on -one. It means we are getting feedback from the right people, one, and it, we are getting feedback from people who have interacted with you a number of times. So basically, you can't just tell us that it is uh, solely based on emotions because basically people are not irrational actors and the number of people who will not like you for, for no apparent reason is very minimal compared to the ones that um, will judge you for a specific uh, reason. So what do we bring to you in this debate? panel, we show you why it is important that we judge people on a specific scale. We show you how it will aim in correcting um, the justice system and better, um, 
better addressing the aims of the justice system. We also tell you that uh, my partner talks to you about how it will become difficult for powerful people to control the court and prevent reoffending. I reiterate that because I show you to the extent that we are judging people on a personal merit, it becomes better. Cancel culture works and still exists on their side of the world, at least on our side of the world, we are cancelling people for the right reasons and for the inherent reasons that... Yeah, thank you. The Deputy Prime Minister for a fine speech will now invite the Deputy Leader of Opposition to round up the debate for the opening half. Hear, hear. So I'll take um, POIs from... All right, I'll take um, POIs from OG. <coughs> Panel, if we allow a lot of assumptions to continue into this debate, we're going to have a messy round, right? So if we assume things like the machine could tell you actually the reason why people actually even vote in the first instance is something that should not even run in today's debate. What this thing is showing is just the votes and you know not necessarily the reasons and all of those things these guys tell you, right? The first thing they tell you is that you know you must consider the idea of you know urgency and the necessity for today's debate. So in their world, that idea of urgency tends to create a world where they want people to do good, right? But if you consider the idea of urgency, and panel, you must note this down. If you consider the idea of urgency, one thing becomes more important in today's debate. That is the idea of the type of society that we live in, right? We live in a society that continually clamors for an accommodation of different forms of people that exist within that space. So you exist within the space of LGBT, blacks, and all, right? So minority groups continue to exist and clamor for more inclusions within that space. In the, in, in the same class of urgency that they tell you is that it requires a world where we create a more friendly mechanisms across, um, you know, for the access of resources and justice, right? rather than a system that continually excludes the people that they tend to want to protect, which are the minorities, right? We think it's problematic for two reasons. Secondly, the people they tell you is that, you know, they say people tend to behave better. This is principally wrong because the idea is that you transform people from being normal human beings to becoming 24 hours job human beings, living fake lives because they need to necessarily get credibility from people that exist within status quo. Panel. Any system in the world, you know, that has an integrated technology that seeks to rank individuals through social discourse and perception is the worst kind of system that can exist in the world. Panel, it is worse than AI, it is worse than Neuralink, in fact, it is worse than invasion of privacy. The reason is because, you know, this constitutes extreme outcome of human dignity of person, and let me explain. In status quo, right? People's social standing is already determined by things like, you know, how upright they behave within status quo, their respect to things like tax payments, traffic obligations, and all of those type of things, right? Why this is important and different from their own analysis is because this is an objective metric for how this would actually be judged. But in their world, this fails to consider inherent biases that exist in human beings, confrontational, you know, and selfish reasons that actually exist in human beings. So you do not automatically erode those things and assume that human beings become better because they are given the opportunity to, you know, give social credibility of other people, right? They assume a lot of things, right? Like classes won't exist and all of those things. Classes will still exist. We still give these people more rights to buy votes for people to actually, you know, give credible things about themselves, right? But they also say things like, you know, on their own, even if we agree on their own, justice clash, right? People's personalities that they can't control or do anything about, you know, that in their own 
in their own justice class, right? People have personalities that they can't control or do anything about. It means ultimately, Ayafa could be judged, you know, just by the idea that he doesn't smile and people can presume he's very proud. This is a very, very important case that you need to, you know, address in today's debate. These guys never engage the heart of today's debate. The next thing to do is to tell you what type of world these guys create. Your, like I said, your world turns people to, you know, 24 hours job as far as you are in the disc space of this course. You know, this beats the fundamental structure of being human being in the first place. That is, no freedom, strictly pushed by mechanized incentives that we think are bad, right? Because if humans are incentives to, if humans are incentivized to behave in a certain way for others humans, for other humans to give good credibility about them, then they are likely going to behave, you know, in the best type of way appealing to those humans, not on the grounds of how they are created and how society should look like. I'll take you. Why is living such a fake life so bad if it delivers the outcomes of society? One, because it is not, you know, preservable. Secondly, it is not sustainable because in the long run, these systems will break and it becomes more chaotic for, you know, the society at large because people can only live a fake life for a particular period of time. But in a case where it becomes the norm, notice why in my next minute, I'll show you why that's actually a big problem, right? <coughs> Next problem is that, apart from the principle, right, the conditionality attached to this is that even if we might agree that this world, you know, is assuming, sorry, we might agree to this world if it's just going to assume to, you know, operate within, you know, very funny spaces like social media and it doesn't give you that conditionality of getting, you know, justice or resources from corporations, right? It is very important to note why this is important. Because in status quo, things like goodness tests actually exist, where people go into the street and test people for being good. Where it stops is that people see you on social media and can have a perception about you. Corporations do not use this to give access to resources or justice, you know, in the, in the, in the grand scheme of things. But in your world, that mechanized conditionality is a problem and we tell you that it fails in today's debate. What of those type of society do we live in? First, we live in a society where people exist with different dimensions, right? I'm not taking you, you have your chance to engage. We live in a society where people exist with different dimensions. What this means is that clashes that will exist is that People will now likely go to vote just because of their own inherent perceptions, because of the type of groups they belong to. So people who belong to minority groups are less likely going to be voted out. Imagine you are conservative living in a liberal society. What type of society do you think will actually run? Or what type of voting system do you think will run there? You are going to be voted out on things like your economic opinions, your dress style, you know, and your belief about things like LGBT and all of those type of things. These guys fail to engage that world because they think they assume that humans will neglect these things or their voting will be independent of who they are, how they behave, and the way they act. Panel, this sort of technology sits on the same pedestal, you know, with that that exists in China. That's China's credit system, right? The problem is this system is that you can never have a universal acceptable system because we behave differently even in the same spaces, right? Panel, notice that humans will always push for and even and in fact on just type of you know system or relationships with other humans the reason why i'm going to hate my uncle sometimes is because maybe i assume he's rich and should be able to solve my problem and do not do this right but the reason why he does not do this is not in consideration so he might not do this for a couple of reasons one maybe because he has other issues that he needs to attend to but a more practical example is a person walking into a coffee shop who is very very much you know low on time but because there's somebody who is not you know disabled their society expects him to allow that person stay in front of the line. But a lot of conditionalities is wrong as to why he doesn't allow this person stay in front of the line. All this sophistication and neglected by these guys, they assume that people become automatic within the spaces of choice, right? This system is no different from what Nazi government did to the Jews, right? To the extent to which you can prove or we can prove that this actually is consistent with that word because you consess people and shape them into behaving in a particular way other from how they are as human beings. Because if I'm unable to relate with people just because I was born like that with certain levels of, you know, introvert nature, people are still going to vote. People do not give a fuck about why I'm behaving like that, but just the idea of their relationship with me. These guys don't engage that, and that's why they're automatically last, even if they're the only ones in this room, right? This system is evil. It creates a fake world that will break down eventually. We tell you why this world is not sustainable, even if they say they prioritize a world where it's better for it to be fake and do good. It is not sustainable because in the long run, it breaks down because people can't maintain the system. These guys should engage their engagement in today's debate. They don't do a good job. We thank the Deputy Leader of Opposition for our fine speech. Before we invite the Member of Government to come and extend this debate, 
Um, very important announcements. Please make sure the mic is seated and try to be more audible so we don't have like sound problems. Thank you. Am I audible? And is it clear? Yes. Okay, great. If I come in. Okay. No worries. So panel, taking opening opposition out because they argue a couple of things that, oh, already incentives exist within status quo and then you can't force people to abide by social pressures. Mm -hmm. Let me quickly respond to that before we get to the CG case. It's because, one, the debate is not about whether you get cancelled and people stop following you on social media, but it's about whether you should be denied access to certain services or, two, whether at the point in time where you are being tried, you should get a longer sentence or a shorter sentence. But even then, assuming that the incentives already exist, understand how these incentives, like they point out, are already skewed against the same minorities that they value in today's debate by things like lottery of birth, virtue of the fact that you are African and you cannot get on a global scale, you cannot earn money like the white cis man, and those things are naturally already skewed against you. I'm not sure what anything systematic or, like on our side is worse than that on their side. But then notice how they say, you know what, if something ha bad happens, people will bite back. It's not enough incentive because the fact that I'm on Twitter and somebody 2,000 miles away is telling me that my opinion is bad, it's really no incentive for me to change because I can easily put off my data and not really be concerned about someone else's opinion. I'm unsure as to why that is really important. But then panel, the biggest thing they then say is, um, left people will cancel right people, and that's like that is a problem. I'm unsure as to why disagreements within status quo cannot happen without people fighting each other. We are here having a debate on disagreeing sides, but we are not fighting each other at the end of the day. We are unsure as to why that's a nuance. But then even notice, even if left is cancel um, can sorry, right people, the large majority of what is going to happen is it to be neutralized. So at the end of the day, it's the central people who don't really, um, who are not really moved by your, pop, um, your ideology as to whether you are liberal or conservative are then going to be the ones who have the net vote on your, like who you are in your social standing. That argument is like largely a wash. But then panel. What then is the debate from closing government? Is that one, the debate is not about crimes because legal systems already exist to take care of that. It is rather about the interactions that people have with each other. The only um, way, sorry, the only fast, like the only point at which this exists is, for example, in um, sentencing, and we will get to that soon. Panel, we deal then with the core concept of what exactly happens within today's debate and how you reach out with not discrediting because you are providing, an, like, like we are not discrediting opening because we provide the actual incentive or the core of what really happens in today's debate, which is at what point does interacting with people really value a credit system and why is it crucial and why should we buy and prefer into it within today's debate. So one. Panel, we tell you that the human e existence in itself is coupled with a large variety of uh, interactions which are largely very complicated. A world then that provides more holistic contribution and general outcomes on perception of people is a world that we prefer within today's debate. Notice that up says that there's already enough incentive. I've already responded to you how this largely does not really reflect within status quo. But then secondly, notice that the alternative feedback on their side is still not holistic enough because you can just be denied a job for being black based on the opinion or the perception of the hiring manager or who is head of HR in a particular company. In a world where there's a more holistic interaction that determines the fact that you are worthy of a job or worthy of particular services, then it's a more holistic one. But then notice, they make the holistic argumentation seem as if just because I have a bad day today and someone gives me a bad score, I'm automatically going to end up being a bad person. The idea of the credit system is that one, it's on a large majority of people that have interacted with you, and two, most importantly, it's over a large like period of time. So even if you have one bad day, there are still several other good days that would cancel all the next bad that could have happened. You have the opportunity to rectify the scores that exist. So even if you are a Texas 
um, conservative person, like Ayafa says in today's debate, they cannot be the only people that you interact with with the rest of your life. I'm unsure of as to why that is the truth that happens within today's debate. But then, panel, what then makes a holistic world better is a world where everybody has a voice, everybody who has interacted with you and knows who you are pro provides a better opportunity. But then, panel, the ability to then eradicate the power imbalance that exists on their side, I've analyzed you why that is the most important thing, but then even systematic is worse on their side. But then, let's look at the core of why, the, why these interactions are then very important within today's debate. Is that it provides an exclusive avenue of self-reflection for individuals within society. The biggest pushback you get from up is that, oh, people are going to live a negative life, or people are going to live a fake life. Here's why that is not exclusive to just our world. People in society already live by societal expectations. They are already succumbing to societal pressures. I'm unsure of as to why this is different or why this is even more exclusive. But then even if they live a fake life, we think in a world where you can be judged by being good or bad, the fact that you are benefiting from that is equally a net good at the end of the day. We think that is a world we are ready to bite the bullet and get a, like, a, an important trade-off. Panel, we are think, telling you that in a world where people have an incentive to change or people who want the opportunity to change, what this then provides is a unique ability to not just use your family's opinion or your brother's opinion, but the general society and what is generally better based on the kind of cumulative scores and holistic view and approach that you've gained. We think there's a far better opportunity than what up presents by societal pressures, which in their world is largely to be skewed. But then the second most important thing is how this interacts with the, them, the criminal justice system. OG lightly touches on this, but then they lose out on one, the mechanisms and the direct impacts as to why minorities are then affected. Notice how within status quo, a black person being profiled in US is highly likely within status quo, which means minority already feel like they are largely disadvantaged within society. But then before I continue, yeah, Eva. So that's the whole point. The idea that people will still interact with each other on a much larger scale, and it's a cumulative thing that takes care of all the skewed ideas that exist on their side. But then notice how the conversation on leader impacts is that in status quo, people make mistakes. People are flawed. People are accused wrongly. In a world where that largely affects the kind of systems that already happen, considering that the CGS is already largely damaged, which means minorities and the larger group of people already don't have an incentive to trust these CGS systems. What then happens is that we provide a more on or authentic or more proof worthy way for minorities to trust that they are being judged fairly because it is based on the points that they have accumulated and not because a judge is biased against you because you are black or biased against you because you are white or you were in a fight with a white person but based on the fact that the cumulative good that you've done in the large society or the cumulative bad that you've done in society gives a reflection on who you are and that judgment is what is based on. What that then does is create an, an, amount, like, a, 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 an increased amount of trust from these minorities within these legal systems. Understand why these criminal justice systems and this um, judiciary need that trust to function properly and engage in the order that is crucial within society and why that is very important. At the end of the day, the true crack of the debate is at the point where these interactions yield these kind of outcomes and these interactions inform the kind of people and the kind of decisions that they make. Proudly opening, sorry, closing government. We thank the member of government for that fine speech. We we'll now welcome the member of opposition to extend this debate. Here, here. I would, I would prioritize the PI from you guys so you don't get left out in the debate. So, um, I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. Panel, there are a couple of observations you need to make for you to really, really assess this debate properly. There is very, very minimal engagement in today's debate because everybody argues on parallel lines. This is largely because of the stance that OO takes because all OO does is that they say that this is not a feasible thing to do because largely they're going to have a lot of mechanistic problems that would exist. Recognize that in a this house prefers motion, you are supposed to at best credit OG with a fiat of feasibility. So yeah, it could work. People could be able to assess these things. Why is it inherently bad as a matter of principle? 
What does this do to many factors and to many factions of society? And why is it something that shouldn't happen? We would at least credit OO for one like, brilliant case they make. They say this is unnecessary because there are other systems of this nature that exist in status quo. That's when you talk about call-out culture, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't think that that's particularly really why we have this debate. Because we could concede that call-out culture in of itself is equally very, very ineffective. The problem with the debate is that these actions is because there is a concession in society that human beings do not live on their own and they have to interact. Due to that interactions, there are a lot of things and a lot of conclusions that are drawn about people. These conclusions can either make people change or make people remain the same. Therefore, the whole purpose of today's debate is to question whether or not the world they propose is one that is going to lead to better human interactions or worse human interactions. Are human interactions in status quo good or is it bad? Why is this the most important clash in today's debate? Because for people to have better change proposed to individuals, for me to tell you, Michael, you need to change and you need to change in this manner, it is because we've, had, we've facilitated a good level of interaction. This means that human interaction is the ground upon which all the gains everybody in this debate wants to accrue has to come from. This is the baseline of this debate. That's why it's the most important case. The only team that tries to engage that is ICG. I'll credit them for that. But how is that still not enough? Panel, we think that for you to be able to draw conclusions about individuals, you need to provide certain levels of metrics. One, there needs to be a reasonable amount of interactions that have been made in order to draw conclusions to, in, to, the, um, to the moral status of individuals. Why? Because individuals are constantly influenced by external factors that are not determined by their own person. Yesterday, I had a bad call after my round. I was very, very rude to a number of individuals. In their world, after that round, they would go online and give me a score of zero, claiming that I am a bad person. In as much as that might seem marginal, we think in the grand scheme of things, it impacts or influences how other people view me, given that this is the most recent kind of feedback that has been given on me. The reason why that is bad is that it does not take into account the surrounding context that particularly constitutes that behavior. We think as such, the judgment that is made on that behavior is one that is inadequate at best. Why, are we, why do we think it's bad for you to have inadequate judgment to rule people's individual lives in that regard? Because when these inadequate judgments are made, they create biases. Because before you would come and interact with me in the future, you'd go online. What was the most recent feedback on this guy? Oh, he's an asshole. Before you talk to me, before you interact with me, you already have it positioned in your mind that I am an asshole. You set a higher threshold for me to satisfy when I am interacting with you. We think that that's an unfair metric to place on individuals. Why? Because we think that it makes individuals themselves to walk on glass shelves in a bit to interact with fellow individuals. We think that's an unfairly high threshold to place upon them because we think that that demands that they constantly critique actions that ideally should come off naturally in that regard. But more importantly, we think that the bigger and broader impact of this argument is one that revolves around the very idea of punishment. Because recognize the debate happens on two fronts. The debate first says, this is a decision, um, BCS or whatever it's called, is a decision that we are going to take. And the second thing is that like, we are going to give you two types of punishment if your, if your scores are not great. First off, businesses do not interact with you and would equally factor this into, your, um, into legal cases. Why is this punishment disproportionate? We think that the very framework of human interaction is one that is economical. For me to be able to like, interact with society, I need to have like, the ability to interact with businesses, the ability to interact with the frameworks of economy, the ability to get people to work with me or to work for me. The reason why this is bad is that you push these individuals into an echo chamber where they do not get any level of economic interaction. What this means is that they become more resentful of society because at that point where they are broke, at that point where they cannot get things done for them, they do not particularly think they are the problem. They think that society is punishing them disproportionately. Why do we know that this is true? We know that this is true because to a large extent, there is no direct feedback as to what exactly you did wrong. All you know is that there's an arbitrary score online. 
Why is this primarily terrible? Because what that does is that you have no idea of what you have done wrong. You do not know who exactly said you're a bad guy because it's probably run with anonymity. We think that what this means then is that individuals are stripped of the opportunity to change. Recognize, panel, that change has been a major contention in this debate. How do we achieve change? We think change can only be achieved when individuals have a fair idea of the route to take in a bid to become better people. If I do not know what I did wrong, I would not know how to correct it. That is why their world does not facilitate change. It is poor. OG. Regardless, like, exactly. If you are rude every single day, we think that then Ayafa is right when he pointed out that mechanistic thing about your world. Because if you are rude every single day, chances are people in your social circles tell you repeatedly that you are rude every single day. But well, why is that more relevant? Because the kind of importance we grant to the kind of feedback we get from people in our social circles is greater than the kind of impact or the kind of um, importance we grant to random individuals. I don't know the judges here. If you think I'm a shitty debater, I probably would not care. But if my coach tells me I am a shitty debater, I will quit the debate because he has seen me over and over and over again. We think that what that means then is that at best, you get people to just have a, a, a siege mentality where they think, Ah, uh, strangers don't like me. Ah, uh, the world hates me. Ah, uh, everybody thinks I'm an asshole. But they don't know what they should do differently. What you do then is that you make them feel bad and depressed because they are constantly trying to self-improve without getting any true chats to self-improvement. In our world where status quo demands that you tell them, guy, don't be rude. Alo told me, don't bang your table. I know not to bang it later. In their world, nothing changes, no change. You just have people having worse human interactions and disproportionately being punished. We thank the member of opposition for a fine speech. We now welcome the government whip to wrap up the debate for the bench. Here, here. Okay, so before I start my speech, since this is being streamed, I'm going to make mention of a few controversial people who have been cancelled. I don't support what they did in any way. It is just for debate. Thank you very much. Because uh, I'll be saying Kanye West and like Andrew Tate and whatnot. Please let me know when you're ready. Okay, am I audible enough? Okay, great. So, panel, three things in this debate. I'm going to respond to OO, I'm going to respond to CO, and then I'm going to show why we beat OG. A couple of things. I think that this debate starts in the closing half, but OO's argumentation still does engage with certain aspects. But recognize, this debate is certainly about perceptions and how people interact with, like how you interact with people. What that then means is that the debate is not entirely about crime because people would not be ranking you on crime. People would be ranking you based on their feelings as it exists in the info slide. So what that then means is that the only part of this debate where it affects the criminal justice system is the part of the debate where it says you get lesser sentencing or more sentencing. And that is what the debate is about. When it comes to crime police, they are there, they would arrest you, like that is not the debate. We don't want a system where people are dressed. You can call the police, that's what the debate is about. So then let's get to OO's case, right? OO's case is very, very disingenuous. In such a motion, you need to like, assume that this thing can work. You can't say your response to this is that it can't work. It can work. The reason why this can work is because in most instances, like governments have developed applications that everybody can access. In Ghana, we all buy electricity on a government made up. People vote on applications across the world. Like That can't be mechanistical issues that you're going to deal with in this debate. But then they then argue something important that not so important, but they argue it, that incentives already exist. Panel. Before I get to why those incentives are bad, they don't explain the way up on why those particular incentives that already exist for people to do good is so good that we don't need an additional incentive or an additional structure. Because you can't just say because something exists, there's no need for additional like, structure to exist in society. Insofar as we've been able to prove to you that there's, a, there's certain utility, exclusive utility from closing government that allows you as an individual to reflect, allows you as an individual to get proof of being a good person, we think that that outweighs their argument, right? But then recognize, what do they say are the things that 
could be used against you or could be used for you to show that you're a good person by paying your taxes. Yeah, that's why rich people are seen as the most um, good people in the world. That's what DPM said by um, council culture. Recognize that council culture is so inefficient. I could be such a good person all my life and do one single bad thing and everybody then says, cancel this individual. This individual is extremely horrible. And that is why I think Prospect's case is very interesting because I'm going to engage that. That is what happens in their world rather and that is something that doesn't happen in our world. So recognize, I've already explained to you how these incentives that exist already are inherently flawed. But especially in a world where there's extreme polarization, you don't saw polarization in your world because they say, oh, the left and the right will not discuss anything. So if you disagree with me, I would, I would give you bad rankings. Well, the people that agree with me will equally give me bad rankings. Like, I'm not sure why people will not talk anyway, because in the status quo, we hate each other according to him, and we engage each other anyway. But here's the difference. Recognize, this particular rankings is based on the feelings that people have about you. What that then means is that this course is more likely to be polite in our world, because I can tell someone that your idea is shit. I don't like the way you are doing a particular thing, but do it in a way that is very nice to ensure that these people are not feeling horrible after the conversation with me or don't hate me. What that then means is that discourse still happens in our world, but that discourse is not something that is very disgusting or is very volatile because people now recognize that the way you treat people, the way you talk to people could then impact the way they are going to rank you. So recognize discourse still happens in our world, but discourse happens better. Moving on to the other cases in this particular debate. I'll take you soon, right? So recognize, right, that CO's case is fantastic. Prosper argues very important things in this debate, that in this world, one single event could cause someone to give you a zero. If you listen to closing government framing of this particular debate, we explain to you that this mechanism to incentivize people to do good is extremely important because of the holistic nature of it. Holistic in terms of scope of the number of people you are going to meet and the scope of the number of years that it's going to exist. So let's assume that when you're a child, it doesn't exist and it starts on the day you turn 18. What that then means is that from the time you're 18, where you're conscious, you take your own decisions, all the activities you do in life are being scored actively by people that interact with you. Recognize, people that interact with you in real life. What that then means is that one single event can't actually screw you up. Because in that example, if Prosper was rude to someone outside because that particular person was not nice to him in a round, just because Prosper was rude to that person once does not reflect that Prosper is inherently a bad person. So our side of the debate actually actively responds to Prosper's case because it is in this world where people are consistently being cancelled for the slightest thing that they do. Recognize that in status quo, just because you are rude and you are not nice to one particular person, that particular person can form an opinion around you that you are completely bad. But let's say I'm rude to you today, and you think I'm rude, and you give me a bad score. But upon giving me a bad score, you recognize that my general score is still a positive score. You then begin to rethink this, and then analyze whether or not I'm a bad person. Um, uh oh. Okay, so the problem here is this, right? Is that we've already mentioned this before. What's the likelihood that the person, this person that suffers racism, begins to speak about this racism? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like this is this is the weirdest case out of it all because people who suffer from racism have an incentive to speak against racism because in this particular world you don't have any numerical advantage against the global poor and the global south the people that are consistently being oppressed they have their numbers if it is a voting system all these white racist motherfuckers are going to go to hell in terms of this particular racing system because you're going to rate them and give them negative points till they stop fucking us up so you can't take this particular argument and have it because in the world the elite people are not more than the people that are poor like you can't just say all of a sudden poor people are going to hold back and not want to respond to these particular things, right? But recognize, here's how we win the debate. We give you a unique impact that no one talks about. I've already explained the holistic nature. But secondly, the conversation about self-reflection. Recognize that his Prosper says you could be rude because people around you say you are rude. Like, it's fine to be rude. That's the point. You could have certain character traits that you think is completely fine because people around you say it is fine. So when you go outside once and someone says, I don't like the way you speak, I don't like the way you engage with me, you don't think that that particular person's feedback is good enough. But what happens in our world is that you as an individual have a holistic amount of feedback that allows you to self-reflect. They can't say that you won't know who gave you the feedback and what happened because the feedback is after the person has interacted with you. So if today at um, 9.40 p.m. I interact with a Latif 
and then at 9.45 p.m., I get a zero on my score, I know that it is because of the interaction I had with Latif and how I treated Latif that gave me that zero score. So at the end of the day, right, you can trace what happened, you can tell why you're getting negative scores, and at least you can self-reflect, recognize that this particular argumentation is about people who want to change or people who are willing to um, add to society in a positive way, but are not sure how they are not doing that. At the end of the day, people are able to change their lives. People are able to become better because there's a more holistic approach to scoring their lives and telling them whether or not society thinks what they are doing is good. It's been a good day to propose. The government whip for wrapping up the debate for the bench would now invite the opposition whip to do same for their bench. Here, here. Okay, so um, starting in three, two, one. Prosper's extension is the most relevant argument to get in today's debate. Because Prosper argues that for you to have social change, that means that people need to constantly be interacting with each other. What he explains is that in the world that government creates, everyone is working around eggshells because no one wants to get bad ratings, etc. right? What that specifically means is that there's no incentive for them for people to help point out the specific things that people should change about themselves that will lead to the self-introspection that CG wants to achieve within today's debate, right? That means that specifically for closing government, there is no self-introspection because there is no interaction, there is no discourse. People are not talking to each other because they fear how other people might see their stances on the issues, right? Let me even be more spe specific. Imagine living in the context like West Africa, right? You are unsure what individuals think about LGBTQ in the first place, right? And so there's no incentive for you to even bring it up in the first place. That means that Elisha cannot argue that, oh, people will be more polite in the way they even discuss these things in the first place. What Prosper explains is that this discussion won't even happen at all for people to be polite because you don't know what the individual stance is on that specific issues and you don't want to get bad ratings, right? That means that the impact that closing government argues in today's debate is one that is not achieved. What is the second pushback they have to prospects extension? They say that, well, these things are just externalities of the fact that we are having a bad day, we're just externalities, they were just one-off events and there's no need to consider them, right? Know that, first of all, two responses to this specific argument. Know that, first of all, there's recency bias. So in an instance where Prosper was maybe angry yesterday and he was rated zero over 10 yesterday, when I see this thing tomorrow, I might assume, well, oh, well, Prosper is becoming a bad person, right? That means that the people who are rating him for maybe last week coming to this week are rating him badly, right? That means he's becoming a bad person. That means that the impact Elisha wants to argue, right, does not really happen in the first place. But you know that most of these negative externalities can accrue over time. What does this look like? It looks like things like being unemployed in countries like Ghana because there are no jobs. It looks like coming out and being clear in countries in, in countries like in places like West Africa, right, because there's massive amounts of homophobia. That means that all these toxic socializations that, make you, that makes you look like a bad person, even though you're not a bad person, can accrue over time and people can consider you to be a bad person even though you are not a bad person, right? And that's why we are extremely relevant in today's debates, right? So, like, the last thing they push back, right, is once again, self-introspection. What Elisha says in his speech is that, oh, well, these things are just one-off events, right? And people want to consider it as part of your grand rating. And then Elisha, in the same vein, argues that because of that one specific thing that's an externality, it will push you to then look into yourself. If you agree that it won't make any impact, right? How can those things then push you to look into yourself, right? And that's why CG does not have any impact. Another reason why CG does not have any impact is because they assume that, well, um, they assume two things. 
that first of all, you can be able to know the specific traits that's like um, um, specific traits that should change. In the instance where these things are extremely anonymous, right? Because of I'm sure this are like this is a likely way of this thing being implemented, right? So people don't attack other people for giving them bad ratings. In the instance where this thing is anonymous, right? People cannot communicate the specific things that they should change in themselves, right? That means that you don't get the change that they want to achieve. But then, like, but then secondly, because in their like because in their world, right? Um, you say that people should re introspect and people should re assess their things and they don't know the specific things that they should change. They are forced into a cyclical loop of constantly questioning themselves, constantly assessing what is wrong about me, what am I doing wrong, and stuff like that, right? And those things push you into an instance where you are extremely depressed, you don't know what's wrong with you, you can't figure those things out, right? And people feel more shitty on their side of the house, and that's why, like Elisha's, like um, uh, CG's case, cannot fly within, like, within today's bits, right? So let's move on to opening government. I think that there's been a massive concession in today's debate that today's debate is not about crimes, right? They are just about things or the way in which people perceive other people within society, right? Why is this extremely like relevant in today's debate? Because their biggest impact is that they want people to change. And that's why PM says you want to stop bombing Palestine and stuff like that, right? Why is how does prosperous extension engage this? In an instance where there are no interactions and people cannot know the specific things that they should change, right? That means that they don't achieve the social change that they want to achieve on their side. So it is only with prosperous extension that you can realize OG's impact. Why is that contribution extremely relevant to the way in which you as a judge should judge today's debate? Because all, all, all what OO says is that, oh well, there are other incentives for you to change. But what Prosper says is that it is only in our world right, that we can make you change because there are massive amounts of interactions. People are not afraid to interact with each other and have discourse and, like, and all those kind of things. Right? And that's why our world is extremely relevant. right? But then, before I move on, opening government. And the vote that happens is a result of the amalgamations of different people's opinions. Why then will that begin to dispute the most negative aspect? The last thing I want to point out, right, is an, a, a faulty premise that runs the entire, like, from the entire government. They assume that the evaluation of the larger society is something that is a good thing, right? I argue that in most instances, the evaluation of society is one that is extremely shitty, right? Because those things are usually biased in favor of the larger majority, right? So, for example, you are alone when you come to Ghana and people see your head to be braided, but immediately assume that you are a bad person, right? Because of the socialization that they've gone through. What that specifically means is that in most instances, people might not necessarily be bad, right? But then because of the kind of negativity things that exist within these spaces, we assume them to be bad. So it is not in all instances that the evaluation of society is one that is extremely bad, right? And that's why these guys do not have a case. The reason why this specific observation is relevant to this debate, once again, is because of what Wesley says in his speech. Because she says that minorities will not be treated fairly in the court of law. I think I have pointed this out in his PR. But not specifically that because of the inherent biases that exist against, for example, black people, right? And so, because there are no inter Actions, people are scared to interact with each other. People are now affirm those biases because of the lack of interaction that Prosper argues to you in his speech. What that specifically means is that these minorities that Wesley wants to protect so badly are not protected, and you affirm those biases against them, and they are more likely to be treated poorly on the other side of the house. What sh should be the way of today's debate? Why should you give the win to close the position in today's debate? The entire house wants to achieve social change. OG argues that they say they want to achieve social change through the parents. Prosper says we can only argue social change through interactions. OO says that you can argue social change through council culture. Elisha will back that. But Elisha's rebuttal does not attack Prosper's arguments of social interactions. So everybody wants to achieve social interactions. It is only Prosper that like, shows how you get social interactions because it's the only one that argues that more people will be willing to interact on outside of the house. Right? And that means that people are more willing to concede and let go of the biases that they have, right? Because we pop into your, the inherent things that make up your worldviews and that form your opinions. But on our side, you can't question those things because everyone is afraid to interact with each other, and that's why we pick their win. We thank the opposition week for that fine speech. We now advise that you give us some space to deliberate and get back to you with rankings. With the blind now.